Hi there, I'm James Chai, and I am uh, giving you a live broadcast for October 9th, 2019, episode number 14, and uh, I am doing this from my computer. Uh, and so I have uh, joint technology, and I'm doing something that is um, kind of cool here. So um, I, I'm kind of looking forward to, to all the stuff here. Uh, interestingly enough, I am trying to figure out how to use this. I thought I was going to be able to screen share, but apparently I'm not going to... Um, be able to. I hope everyone's doing well. I hope this is working because I, I honestly don't have any idea if it's coming on. It's actually not even giving me a, uh, a report. But um, let me just double check here as I kind of drive everything out. Oh, okay, the, so there are people watching. Hello, everybody. Uh, I thought I was going to be able to screen share, but unfortunately, um, it's not letting me do that, which is a huge, huge drag. Uh, and so um, I have put down in the descriptions today of uh, the things that I am talking about. And um, I'm just here, it's just, like I say, just, I don't even know what's going on here. I'm just not great with technology. Right. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. all right, apparently I am. Okay, I'm a few seconds behind myself. Um, all right, so uh, today's October 9th, 2019, episode number 14. And I am, uh, I should actually be in full uh, proper perspective too, because I'm raising up my right hand. I'm doing this right. So uh, grandpa has learned how to use technology, everybody. So I hope you're all happy about it. Um, it's kind of weird for me to see this, to see myself as I'm talking on that. And I'm going to try to make eye contact with the little white light here. And um, okay, so uh, a couple of topics I'm going to be talking about, and then I'm going to go through keynotes, and that will be pack or group of dogs. And the other one is dogs love hugs. And I think I've talked about the dogs loving hugs before, but I definitely want to be able to uh, go over that in a little bit. Um, I was going to go and try to, if I could have screen shared, I was going to put up a, a video in regards to um, uh, one of the my, one of my training videos that I have on my YouTube channel. This way, I could have gone over it, and I and I think I'm going to do that next time. Obviously, I won't be live, but I would love to be able to do some screen sharing of a, a video and talk about it. Like, for example, Gordon the disabled bulldog that was reactive that. Um, I shared his post, otherwise he would have been killed literally. So uh, I was able to get some publicity on that part in regards to getting it uh, shared out. And, you know, um, you know, Axel, the German Shepherd, uh, and all the other videos I want to kind of get to uh, one day and be able to just share what, what I'm doing. Uh, regards to my uh, broadcast pre-notes that I put up here, I'm just going to go over them, and then I'll go through everything as well organically. Uh, so it's going to be vlogging instead of commenting, and uh, I have a closed group that anybody's welcome to join, of course. But I have, uh, I think I'm just going to keep to just a vlogging instead of commenting because, uh, as I said the other day, it's when I have to comment and type it all out and it takes me literally, um, uh, like, you know, what would take me five minutes to explain will take me 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour to figure out how to write it all out and then to formulate it into that part of um, uh, just being understood. I want to say thank you to awesome Mastiff lovers uh, for hosting a group uh, vlog uh, session this afternoon with me. I want to say uh, thank you to Stephen Elliott out in the UK who uh, had me uh, come online and also do a, 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 a training session uh, vlog with one of the dogs that he has there uh, for Jackie. And so uh, hi Stephen and uh, Jackie as well named Jackie who runs Awesome Massive lovers and I want to say thank you to Peace Love Danes and uh, I want to say thank you so much to that group as well uh, for for doing the support right off the bat and just kind of pushing the work that I do and then um, okay so I'm gonna go back to uh, vlogging instead of commenting and then I want to uh, start uh, the other one is gauging environment that the dog exists and perceives your dog's bodyguard tone and speed of voice eye contact and be casual Adjust tone immediately, conversational words, children talk, your dog expects the other shoe to drop, dogs 100% love hugs, physical intimacy is trust, coming for affection, gaining trust, understanding relational dependency of touch, how it resets, don't push progress. Uh, the other thing that I was going to talk about last night that I couldn't, uh, ran out of time, I'm watching the clock here as well, I don't want to go over an hour. Uh, like I say, it takes me four to six hours to do this just by, you know, first I got to think about it, try to write out notes. And then when I do the broadcast, if I do an hour, it takes me another two hours to do that broadcast, write keynotes on it because I have to go over all the points, write it all out, the key points so people can follow it. 
uh, and then then post it up, upload it, and it's it's really quite consuming. So if you are uh, learning from any of this, I, I'm please asking you to share my my post. Uh, I'm asking if you could please uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and all that stuff. Help, help me support. Help me show uh, and teach the world uh, how to work with dogs without using medication, without using treats. I have 100% accuracy, and I know it sounds absolutely arrogant and so forth like that. It's not meant that way. I'm just pretty straightforward when I talk about things like this. But my success rate, my progress rate is 100%. Never killed a dog, never recommended a dog to be killed. Uh, I have never refused a dog, no matter who has approached me with it. So this is something that I'm trying to do. Again, um, if you can, uh, and thank you, Lori from Peace Love Danes as well from being one of my first supporters on it. Uh, John Pollock as well from the Adoptos Massives and Adoptos Great Dane groups that um, shares it as well with their uh, everybody with their tens of thousands of uh, members. I really am flattered, humbled by this. Um, coming from the fact that I am not great public speaking, this has been something that. Um, you know, it's a it's a legacy. It's a, it's, it's one I'm going to leave as a digital legacy, and hopefully, uh, decades, centuries from now, people will look back at what I'm doing and go, "Wow, you know, it it made sense." It's just like Jane Goodall and her work with the primates and uh, recognizing the primates having names versus having uh, uh, serial numbers for who they were. Each primate numbered this, numbered that, numbered that. Uh, what I'm talking about when it comes to the dogs is connecting the dogs on a visceral level, recognizing that dogs indeed have a sentience. That ability to comprehend what is going on, having an emotional context, have a rudimentary context in, in regards to logic processing, how they work instinctively, intuitively, on that visceral aspect of it, communication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, going back to the other thing here is uh, introducing a new dysfunctional dog into your existing family of dogs. Importance of preventing immediate dog on dog attacks. Watch for opportunistic or predatory nuances and responsibility is always the humans. When it comes to the part of uh, preventing uh, dog on dog attack, I did talk about this the other, um, was it three, four uh, episodes ago in regards to breaking up a dog fight and how to do so physically without hurting yourself and ensuring that if you are dealing with your dog who is predatorial or just extremely dangerous, how not to be uh, attacked when they turn on you if that happens. Uh, everything I talk about comes from my experience of over 1,400 days and over 20,000 hours alone with predatory dogs. I have that unique skill set. And these are dogs, again, that have been declared extremely dangerous and uh, have been turned down by uh, master dog trainers, behaviors, uh, people who have writing university textbooks have turned these dogs down. So I've done this all without medication, without treats, without prong collars, without alpha, without shock collars, none of these brute force, uh, uh, archaic, uh, devices that are uh, reflective of um, lack of knowledge and experience and all of that comes from the academia from the dog training industry which continues to um, uh, not understand what's going on and they have a 60% success rate whereas mine is 100% okay so that that's a horn that's tooted and all that stuff when I get past that, I just feel like I always have to talk about that I apologize if I have a different voice today I was outside in the um, uh, working with this a really cute uh, dog and um, it, it's just beautiful to see how um, people are really embracing what I'm doing and really starting to uh, just understand what I'm talking about. They're, they're really starting to understand that it works and they're not having to use any medication, not having to use any treats and connecting to their dogs. And their dogs are paying attention and the, and the, and the movement forward is really well. I want to say thank you to Ivy for uh, hiring me and uh, working with her really adorable hooligan. Is, this is an adorable uh, dog, and um, you know I'm not going to be too specific about this, just in case, um, you know. But uh, he's a, he's just a, just a puppy, and she just needed to have some puppy training done for him and have him understand the psychological aspects to keep him a bit more calmer, uh, so he wasn't so rambunctious. He's a husky, actually, um, in, in that part. But in regards to every breed, has a different aspect of behavior, of course but they are always still generic templates of psychological behavior that occurs, just like human beings. We all have a psychological template that we follow, whether or not it's one of the eight that are out there, one of our, you know, whatever it is, we all have, uh, have that basis. Just like we have stereotypes of humans, regards to race, ethnicities, we do so with dogs, of course, but within reason. But at the end of the day, when you remove the color, you remove the uh, anything, you still have the psychological 
template that's underneath all of us and how our behavior happens that way. So this is what I do when it comes to working with dogs and my ability to succeed with these dogs is not anything that is like, oh, wow, absolutely amazing. It is just something that we can all do absolutely 100% of the time. Uh, and at the end of this, I'll, I'll answer some questions as well. So um, again, I'm really hoping that uh, uh, we can get this, uh, uh, this world changed so that dogs aren't being killed. Okay, so uh, I talked about vlogging instead of commenting. So the next thing here is regards to gauging the environment your dog exists and perceives in. So the biggest part about that is our dogs exist in our environment. In a human domesticated environment, our dogs exist in the sense of what are we doing, uh, what we as in the dog and, our, and, and the human, what are we doing, where are we going, uh, what is the exposure. At the end of the day, dogs being overt codependents and humans being covert codependents and again overt being in the sense that dogs are just basically essentially openly codependent i need you i need you i need you human and humans whereas we are covert in the sense of well you know we don't really want to show our affection too much publicly and that is always that part of what we talk about uh you know evolution survival of the fittest etc and that weakness aspect of it that affects us where interestingly enough when you look at dogs and their behavior being overt codependents uh, they are able to survive as predator, uh, predators in the wild. So it kind of understands that scale of what's happening. Uh, when it comes to gauging the environment our dog exists and perceives in, excuse me, uh, when it comes to that gauging environment the dog, our dog per, uh, exists and perceives in, we want our dog to understand that we're protecting them. So I always come from the, uh, the perspective of, hey, you know what, we got to be our dog's parent. Right? Not, not the part of saying it's a pack aspect, it's on an alpha aspect. All these aspects of uh, a brute force uh, definitions, brute force applications, they don't help. You know, yesterday I talked about the, the, the foolish trainer from Upstate Canine Academy who's using a catch pull on a terrified, reactive, uh, dangerous dog that's muzzled. All he's doing is contributing to that dog, creating a subjugation of uh, emotional context where the dog is no longer able to, to succeed other than the fear of seeing something like that happening again and again and then being able to be reactive due to the consequences of that fear and the improper training uh, by an individual who's looking more for an ego boost than he is for uh, understanding the psychology of a dog. Um, so w when it comes to gauging the environment, we want to make sure that we're always paying attention to what our dog is doing. We always want to make a, make sure we're paying attention to our dog's environment. What is around us? What are we doing? Who is who who is coming near us? What is our dog reacting to the environment as we're walking? A lot of times, you see people walking with their dog, and like today at the at the dog park there during uh, our session, you know, there's there's a number of people there, and they're just talking to each other, and they're just talking to each other, and there's yapping and gagging, uh, ga you know, talking to each other, but nobody's really paying attention to their dog. There's a guy there or a girl there with their dog, uh, their dog who is starting to hump other dogs, and they're not doing anything about it. So the environment is that for that particular dog uh, being humped, it is somewhat of an offense. And I talked a few episodes ago about how to stop a dog from humping and how to uh, reduce the potential likelihood of a dog being humped or attempted to be humped from uh, viciously turning and attacking. So when it comes to this part of just behavior, politeness and manners in the dog park, uh, it's, 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 it's just important that owners are paying attention to their dogs. You know, if you're on your cell phone, it's understandable. Okay, you know, you're feeling a little bit bored. I do the same thing myself. But make sure you look up and make sure you look up and spend as much time as you spend on your cell phone to spend looking up around the environment to see where your dog is, to make sure that your dog knows where you are at the same time so that there is communication that's going on, that there is that silent communication, peripheral or direct eye contact, etc. It is something that's super important that uh, our dogs understand that we are there maintaining communication, body language, silent contact, that eye contact, and that we're watching the environment for our dogs so they are feeling safe. If your dog doesn't feel safe, your dog feels that you're not paying attention to within the, the group, because again, the codependency issue is that your dog is with you, you're with your dog, you are a team. Your dog is expecting to see that you are fully engaged with them at all times. Whether or not you're running around with them, you're playing with them directly, or you're standing 150 feet away watching your dog. 
your dog is always engaging. And though people may not see it and may not understand, your dog is watching you peripherally because your dog processes at one tenth of a second. They're able to, to do so through their field of vision processing, which I say I'll talk about another time point when I get a little bit more complicated uh, as these vlogs go on. Your dog is processing, and, uh, and, and as they are processing, they are able to see what is going on uh, where you are in relation to where you were before, whether or not you're paying attention to them, etc. Uh, I should say, when it comes to dogs processing field of vision, uh, I want to kind of clear that up because uh, Temple Grandin, uh, somewhat in, a, in an immature uh, 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 explanation, saying that animals perceive things as paintings which unfortunately is incorrect. She's somewhat there, she's somewhat scratching the surface in regards to that field of processing, but she is incorrect. And um, it, it is in more of an aspect of redundancy, rhetoric, and um, anticipatory behavior as well as the dog processes field of vision. So um, getting back to the dog park aspect, always pay attention to your dog. If your dog is humping another dog, stop your dog. And you don't have to scream at your dog. You don't have to yell at your dog. You just have to call your dog's name out and just tell your dog to stop it. If your dog doesn't stop, you just walk over to them. As I said in my previous episode, you, you interrupt that, etc. cetera. Um, but you want to have good manners. Because at the end of the day, yes, you can blame your dog for the bad behavior, but it is still your fault. As a human, as the parent, you're responsible for your child's behavior. You're responsible for your dog's behavior. If your dog doesn't expect you to take care of them in that sense of it, then they're just going to run rampant. They're going to be the kid in the cul-de-sac where everybody else goes, oh, you know what, don't go out. In the, I don't want to let my kid out there because the, uh, the, the, the wild kid out there, uh, I don't want you to be around him. And so you want to make sure that you're always watching your dog's environment so you can connect with them, so you can silently communicate with them, so you can show them that you're paying attention. And if you, again, are on your cell phone, Try to spend as much time on your cell phone as you are watching the environment and watching the environment of your dog is in. This is the same thing at home as well. You can hang out at home and your dog is just hanging out there and your dog thinks, okay, this is kind of cool. I'm safe. I'm just playing around. And they feel safe, which is why a lot of dogs that are sometimes skittish or react or dangerous dogs, uh, they're horrific outside. And then once they come home inside, they're like suddenly they're normal and they're not, right? Because they're, they're not on the clock. They're not trying to defend themselves. They're not worried about being attacked. They're not worried about uh, noises and so forth because they're comfortable. Uh, the sound, the ambient sound that is happening all the time, your dog is used to it other than them barking out the window, etc. But you want to make sure that your dog feels that within their environment that they are existing in, that they're perceiving that you are making sure they are safe. And it's as simple as calling out your dog's name. All right, so uh, the next one is, uh, the next point is being your dog's bodyguard. You want to, and I'm just going through the points here, so everyone, you know, we, we can play along in the same home game, right, because we're going through the same points. Uh, you want to be your dog's bodyguard, and this is what I say to people, I say to my clients that hire me, is to be your dog's bodyguard. Pay attention to what's going on, as I said earlier here, right, pay attention to what's going on, and show your dog that you're calmly, firmly, able to defend any environment. And this comes out to one of the first episodes that I did when it came to a dog on leash, a uh, nine-year-old dog being on leash, attacked by uh, three different dogs during his lifetime. We want to defend our dog. We want to show that we are able to protect our dog. And yeah, it can be kind of scary if another dog's coming up reactive. I mean, that almost kind of happened today at the dog park. But <laughs> generally speaking, you know, 90% of the time, the environment's pretty safe. But to your dog, your dog doesn't understand the environment is safe. They live in the immediacy, they live consequentially, whereas human beings live uh, uh, premeditated. So as a human being, I'm thinking what I'm gonna do next, I'm thinking what I'm gonna say next. When it comes to um, a dog, they're reacting consequentially. Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll think to myself tomorrow, I've got a session with, uh, with somebody, so what, where, what time do I have to leave? What do I have to do? What do I have to get ready for? Whereas your dog is essentially going, okay, I'm here. Is this environment safe? I'm fine. Am I reacting? No, because there's no threat. And if the dog is, there's no way the dog, your dog is going to be thinking, well, tomorrow I'm going to go out and start, you know, biting people or tomorrow I'm going to go out and start peeing everywhere. Your dog doesn't think that. You're, they exist in the moment. They're just, just incredible souls. They're like an 
actor, like an artist. They exist in the moment. And we need to respect that because when we're out there for a walk, our dog needs us to be their bodyguard because they are codependent, right? They're, they are our child. And if your dog feels safe out there, uh, it's a, there are different ways to prove it, uh, different ways to show it, you know, like leash control is in another vlog that I spoke of, uh, looking around the environment, etc., cetera, uh, letting your dog know that you're paying attention to everything that's going on because your dog themselves are, is doing it. I have the video of Loki the Shiba Inu from Korea who's extremely skittish, uh, stress defecation, etc. And I'll put the link in here. You'll see him uh, very skittish looking all over the place and uh, by watching his body behavior, etc., I get him to the point where I can actually predict when he's going to turn his head forward and when he's going to turn his head backwards, and I explain why. And I've had an internationally recognized behaviorist who's written uh, university textbooks on ethology and animal behavior who, uh, who, who saw it and was just completely speechless. Uh, and then he didn't talk to me anymore. So, um, you know, I'm debunking everything that happens because we're just doing what we'd normally do in real life. If we had a problem, we would just deal with it. we talk it out. We're not trying to uh, obfuscate it. We're not trying to brute force it. We're not trying to uh, negotiate by giving treats and medication uh, of that. The treat aspect of it is a psychological uh, 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 crutch for human beings to say, okay, this is how we get compliance because we don't understand what you're doing. When in actual fact, nowhere in the canine species, dog, domesticated dog, uh, uh, wolves, hyenas, nowhere in the canine species does food exist as a communication device or as a reward fee it. Now, I want to say hi to the trolls that are watching me. I know that you are because uh, I've heard about it again. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm hoping that you guys are learning from things and maybe uh, kind of maintain a, a stability in your lives. Um, but again, uh, getting back to your dog bodyguard, being your dog's bodyguard, it's just pay attention to the environment. If your dog thinks that you're looking around and making sure that nothing is dangerous, and if there is something dangerous, you're acknowledging it for them in a calm, firm tone of voice, your dog can relax. Because what's essentially happening is it's like having somebody who's really nervous all the time, and they're always kind of like, ah, like that. And you're like, you're, dude, calm down. You're making me nervous. In your dog's perception, if they see that you're more in, in touch and you're more paying attention, you can they will relax more so. You don't want to make it like erratic and, and, and you know unsubstanti unsubstantiated behavior on your part. You want to make it deliberate. You want to make things where it is that you are paying attention. Previous episodes, you'll see all this stuff, what I'm talking about, and as we go on, you see everything makes sense, and then you'll see through uh, all these uh, vlogs that I'm leaving that you will see that there is going to be a true aspect of confirmation regards to the codependency behavior of the dog on a psychological manner with interdependency and interdependency influences in different variations of what your dog's behavior is. So it's a psychological aspect, and thank you so much all for following through on the ride. Okay, uh, next one is tone and speed of your voice. Go to any dog park, watch anybody with their dog. You will see the way and hear the way they talk to their dog. And it is an artificial uh, communication method that we talk to our dogs. We're like, hi, hi, you know, good boy, good, good. We get into the high pitch, we get into the disingenuous tone of voice because we are not connecting viscerally on an emotionally respectful basis with our dog. Every single dog I've worked with, including the ones in-house in rehab, uh, including the ones that people have hired me for to bring them here, including the dogs that I have personally um, uh, adopted to rehab, the ex most extremely dangerous Great Dane in North America, uh, Tonka. Um, I've always talked to them in a regular tone of voice. I've never been disingenuous with my tone because I instinctively, intuitively knew that if I talked to them uh, uh, falsely, they would pick up on that. And then when it needed time for me to actually communicate to Tonka in a, in, a, in a respectful manner, he wouldn't understand that because he wouldn't be used to that because it's not normal conversation to him. And that's why it's important that when you do talk to your dog that you want to maintain a regular conversation of tone. I'm speaking a little bit quickly here, um, but you want to maintain a normal tone of voice and normal conversation as you would be talking to somebody on the phone or in person. Your dog picks up on the intonation on, the, on, on the, the, the cadence, the rhythm, the flow, uh, the way we grammatically structure our language as well determines how we talk as well. You can see even when I'm saying the words uh, grammatically and stuttering and so forth like that, 
That's how we communicate. Our dog picks up on that because they recognize it's normal. When they hear us talking la 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 like that, they shut down. They, 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 they realize that you don't have anything to say to them that is relevant. It's like them, uh, like another dog barking at them. You've seen two dogs and one dog is just barking, 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 and the other dog's just like, whatever. Dog just doing whatever, I don't care. It's just nagging, it's just disingenuous. It's just, it's, it's just something so common that that dog no longer listens to it because it's not relevant anymore. It's, it's disingenuous, it's not real, there's no respect, there's no communication. But when you see a dog that is communicating with each other and, they're, and, and they are barking to each other, you know, it's like, for example, your dog is in the backyard and he starts barking at another dog barking. He's not barking on top of the other dog. He'll bark and you can see he'll look up and he'll face up and he'll bark like a husky does. Look up in the sky, he'll bark, he'll bark in the direction of the sound that it's coming from. And then he pauses. Your dog pauses and listens for the response. They're not stupid. Dogs are absolutely brilliant. That's communication. That's why I said in another episode, previous episode, that if we listen to the way our dog barks, we can actually hear the tone of communication. You just need to pick it up. It's just like the, the dolphins and the whales, how they speak to each other. Uh, well, not to each other, but, you know, to the other whales and other what dolphins, respectively speaking. Uh, they listen to the tone. This is the same thing with dogs. We just, if we look at the dogs as material, as superficial, as property, we're never going to have respect for them. We're never going to want to learn what they're doing because we just go, well, it's just a dog. When we listen to the bark, when we listen to the tone, we understand. Same thing like, why does the dog bark? Why does the dog whine? There's reasons. The whining sometimes comes from codependency, low self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to always be mindful of our tone and our speed of talking. So when I am going to say a dog's name, and I'll use the name I used yesterday, Carlson, what I'm going to do is if I've got to call Carlson, he's across the field or across the dog park, and I want to get his attention, I'm going to say, Carlson, that's it. I'm not going to be like, Carlson, right? You, you hear the difference. We want to be mindful of the tone and speed of voice. And when it comes to establishing our verbal or voice connection, our voice key with our dog, when I work with the owners, I help them discover the key of tone in their voice that their dog picks up on and becomes, uh, establishes that affinity, establishes that communication, the dog's voice key. So that's what we're doing on that part. Um, okay, the other aspect is eye contact, right? And like I said that, you know, if you're on your cell phone, and you're paying attention and, you're like, rah, 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 and your dog is off running off in the dog park, you know, humping other dogs, all that uh, disrespectful mannerisms, you know, it's impolite. And uh, actually, I should say, if your dog is humping other dogs and you're not doing thing, anything about it and he does it again in another park and he does it again and again, it's not your dog's fault. It's yours. Take responsibility, right? So you just step in like a good parent. Just stop it, right? And it's another episode. So, again, if you're on your cell phone and you're like that all the time, you still, if you got to look up, like I say, at least, you know, spend the same amount of time on your cell phone as you do with your dog and that type of time as that type of connection, as that type of focus. Focus on your dog the same way as you focus on your cell phone. Spend the same amount of time. You'll be watching your dog. You'll be making eye contact. And you will see your dog starting to make eye contact with you. And then they go from making overt eye contact to making subtle eye contact, peripherally speaking. It's brilliant what dogs do. You, you would just be absolutely amazed. The predatorial dogs that, that attempt to kill people, they are incredibly brilliant. They are such smart dogs. Their reasoning, call, uh, they're just incredibly intelligent dogs because they've been able to exist through all the emotional functionality levels, right up from the base aspects of it through puppyhood to the adulthood as through all the abusive aspects of it on all dynamics on that emotional functionality on all the dysfunctions, et cetera, et cetera. Maintaining eye contact is also an aspect of respect. So you get the people who say to you, don't make eye contact. You see that when I just talked to you, I looked up in the sky here, always make eye contact. It's not an, it's not an authoritative aspect of it. It's not a dominant aspect of it. It is not a, a subjugative, uh, subjugative, subjugative. Uh, uh, aspect of it. It is an actual relational connection. As I said before, if a person you're talking to is not making eye contact to you, uh, co eye contact with you, you're not going to listen to them. You're going to think there's something wrong. You can think they're hiding something. You're not going to go up to somebody. Uh, you know, if you're going out with your girlfriend, boyfriend, and, and you go up to them and go and, and say, you know, like I love you. 
they're going to be looking me in the eyes, looking me in the eyes. You know, uh, and, and actually, no, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but you know, there there are women who are well endowed, right? Well endowed, and what what's that common joke about it? You know, my eyes are up here. Being genuine, making a connection, trust. When you make that trust connection with your dog, and you're maintaining eye contact. You've got to do so with compassion and emotional context when you're speaking to your dog, talking to them, looking at them at that whole time. Your eye contact has to pay attention to what's going on and what your dog is understanding in that eye communication with them. When it comes to dysfunctional dogs, reactive, skittish dogs, right, you'll see they always make eye contact, even if it's for a fleeting moment in time. And those dogs will make eye contact with you. The predatorial dogs, the most extremely dangerous dogs, even the dangerous dogs, they will make eye contact and they are watching. Yes, of course, in a negotiative, uh, negotiating. Uh, I love this IV today, IV, IVE that I'm adding on to every word now. Um, they are watching you for your behavior. Yes, of course. And there's people like that. Oh, well, you make eye contact with a, at a dangerous dog. They're going to try to attack you. You know what? I make eye contact all the time with dangerous dogs, predatorial dogs. And yes, they, they do become reactive at, at certain points and it's extremely frightening and, and you have to be very careful. Oh, there's Minky. Oh, and Minky is going back to Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, that's something I'll speak about in a future time. But unfortunately, um, the agreement that, uh, that we put up together, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation has failed to follow through on this. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't, can't maintain a relationship with, um, with such a... Uh, uh, Mm, I'll, I'll keep my 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 denigrating comments uh, to myself for this point in time here, but I will go public on this aspect of it as well. Um, when it comes to um, the eye contact, you want to make eye contact with your dog. With the predatorial dogs and the, the extremely dangerous dogs, I won't get too much into that until we get further down in my vlog series. But it just comes to the point of that dangerous predatorial dog is going to be watching you for your behavior, for your not fearing your eyes, but for your overall mannerisms. And that also is uh, relational to your dog's processing of that field of vision. What your dog understands, these are the, these are the things that are happening. And this allows your dog, uh, the predatory or the dangerous dog, to understand what that context is that we're doing. And uh, of course, we want to make sure that we are uh, we are presenting things to them uh, where we are not looking foolish or, or or silly or scared or weak or whatever. We want to connect to the dog, no matter how dysfunctional they are, with compassion and with reality. Uh, and yes, yeah, sometimes courage, of course, with respect. Think of it the same way again. If someone talks to you and they and they hold your hand and say, "I got to talk to you about something." You know, your friend wants to tell you that, you know, the, their wife has left him or whatever. You're, he's going to say, hey, man, I, I got to talk to you, right? And then he's going to talk to you and he's going to say, I need some help. So, you know, I'm distraught, whatever. You're not going to look at your friend and go, yeah, well, you know, it's horrible that your wife has left you after 30 years and it's, uh, it's so sad. I really, You're going to go, man, you know, I'm really sorry that your wife has left you after 30 years. It's so eye contact, right? So the same part of creating that familiarity with our dogs in that aspect. Every single dog will make eye contact. And that goes back to what I'm saying about the dogs in the off-leash park, the running around, making eye contact and all that stuff. It is all relevant and it is all relational and it all creates a bond uh, with your dog in that sense of it. Uh, the next one is be casual, right? So that's with the tone of voice. It's also physicality wise. You see a lot of people when the dog is humping another dog, their dog, right? And then they start running over and they're rushing it over. And like I said in a previous uh, vlog, you just not act normal. If you make it a big deal, then your dog thinks they're in trouble. And then what does your dog think? Well, I'm just going to run away because you can't catch me. And even if you do catch me, you give me heck, well, I got to do it, right? It's, it's I say uh, to people, it's, it's like, um, you know, when you were a kid and your mom wanted you to clean your bedroom and they just nag you and they, right? They nag, right? That's because, and then you don't clean your room. And then a week later, you don't clean your room. A month later, you don't clean your room because you're like, why should I? Because I'm just going to wait till they go DEF CON 200 and start freaking out on me. Then I'll clean it then. And then I'll wait another two months. So you just basically put it off. Same thing with your dog. You're going to get angry at me. You get upset with me. You give me heck. Oh, I'm just going to run away till I have no choice and I'll come to you. It also ends up making your dog fearful of you sub subconsciously. 
because then they're like, oh, okay, when is my human going to blow up at me? Right? We don't want that to happen. We want our dog to be able to trust us. Even when there's a tough, bad situation, even if there's a fight that goes on, we want to reset with our dog so that they feel safe with us, even if they cause the fight or, or whatever. We want our dog to feel safe, and, and it's super important. It's super, super, duper important. Uh, I'm going to go through the rest of the list here. If you have any questions, any comments, please um, feel free to make, uh, you know, post the comments here as well. Um, so, so we got about uh, another 20, 20 minutes here. Um, and the other part is, again, is adjusting your tone immediately. And so what that means is if you do end up getting upset with your dog, when you do get upset with your dog, thanks, guys. Uh, whoever did that, that's awesome. Um, if you do get upset with your dog, which is normal. I've gotten upset at my dogs. I've yelled at them. Uh, you know, I've, even, I've sworn at them too, right, uh, because of things that have happened here. Um, but you got to shift right back down and go, okay, all right come here, you're okay, good boy, and say your dog's name and, and calm your physicality as well and let your dog understand that you're not upset at them. If, you're, if they're doing something rude or ignorant or getting into a fight with another dog, if you're paying attention and not on your cell phone or not talking to people, you're going to see this happening and you'll be able to interrupt your dog before it starts to happen. You'll be able to see it if you're paying attention to your dog's behavior. Just like you can predict when your kid is silent for like 20 minutes, you're like, okay, what are they doing? Or, right? And I see the other thing too is when it comes to, um, uh, you know, when we were kids and, uh, you know, your mom would call out your name you knew just from the instant she called out your name and the first syllable, even the way she went, took her breath, you knew you were either going to get grounded forever or you're going to go out for ice cream. You can hear these things in the tone of your voice, uh, of your mom's voice. Your dog can hear the same way in our voice and our behavior as well. So we want to make sure, we want to know what's going on. Yes, and we're urgent, but we have to maintain casual body behavior Otherwise, our dog thinks they're in trouble, and they see that they're going to be in trouble. What are they going to do? They're going to run away. Sorry, i got to sit up here because I'm sliding down my seat here. So, uh, again, uh, maintain a casual, uh, that part of being stern if you have to be, without straining your voice, and getting right down to the part where, oh, Sammy's behind, below me, um, and getting down to the point where you're just able to calm down. Right? It's the same thing. Uh, for women who are going out with a typical guy who's like, um, you know, uh, you know, if you ever have a fight with a, with your boyfriend or husband, and then five minutes later, he's like, okay, let's go, right? And then you're like, we just had a big fight, and you didn't answer my questions and all that. And to him, he's like, okay, I thought it was over. Why are we fighting about it? So guys are kind of like dogs, right? M women are like cats. Guys are like dogs. No, I'm not going to make that joke there. Um, so uh, <laughs> that innuendo. But so again, like that predatorial aspect of behavior, it's it's consequential to the environment. It's consequential to the stimulus. Adjust your tone. If you've asked your dog to do something, if you corrected your dog, whatever, you've got to adjust your tone. And the next one is conversational words. Use regular language. Like I said earlier, your dog understands when you're talking normal to them. Your dog understands when you're talking to other dogs normally. Oh, Minky and Sammy may end up having a little bit of a play fight now which they're getting ready to. Um, but yeah, your dog understands the conversational tones that you're having, so use conversational words. Like I said the other day, the dog, one, you know, Lincoln's barking out the window, stop yelling. And I did it live. I did it live today in the awesome Mastiff uh, uh, Lovers group as well. He's barking, saying things. Just talk to him, said, stop yelling. Stop it, stop. And he stops conversational tone he understands dogs understand so if we're using the same language that we're using with human beings as we are with our dogs they understand it all makes sense okay uh oh and lincoln heard his name i've got him squired away in my bedroom because uh, i don't want them running around here today because i'm using my my computer for the first time and i don't know how that's going to go um okay so and when you use conversational tone children talk when you're talking to a child what kind of language do you use you're okay. That kind of language. Gentle. That kind of language. Use the same language that you would with a child and use the same way you would talk to a child. 
You're not going to talk down to the child like, oh, you're such a good little boy. You know, and it's like a three, four-year-old child. I'm like, don't talk to me like a baby. And even though if they're talking like a baby to us, they understand when they're being disrespected. That's what your child is saying. Don't talk to me like a baby because your child understands the aspect of respect and conversation and status, not necessarily status, but position with the maturity aspect of it, right? That's why I'm saying everything is psychological. It's all codependent based on it. That's why we got to get these trainers and behaviors and academia to understand this aspect. We got to get Temple Grandin to wake up a little bit and understand what she's talking about. So again, talk to your child, talk to your dog in the same aspects, using the same verbiage, the same uh, language, the same words. Uh, add that to your lexicon, right? You know, the, the abridged version of your lexicon. Use that in your in your language. Um, too bad we didn't have an unabridged lexicon. That would be just phenomenally uh, amazing. But maybe when we hit artificial intelligence, we'll, we'll be like that automatically, which we will be, right? Okay, so um, your dog's behavior. So getting back to that, your dog expects the other shoe to drop. And that is a case of, again, if we're not showing consistency of, uh, of acceptance and respect to our dog and we fly off the handle with them, and again, it has happened. I've done it myself. I've done it with every single one of my dogs. I've been upset with them for whatever reason. I admit that. It happens to all of us. There's nobody that I can say, oh, I never get angry at my dog. Yeah. Okay. Then you don't really have a dog. You have a puppet. But you, you've got to make the, uh, the acknowledgement to your dog of your behavior in a consistency basis. And a dog that comes from a dysfunctional background, a rescue, uh, or even just a dog that you bought from a backyard breeder that uses the drug money, uses it for drugs and all that stuff, um, they are going to, your, those dogs are gonna be even more nervous because of the history, right? Historically speaking, the reference point is, all I've known is this anger, this upset, this uh, flying off the handle sound from my previous human. And I'm expecting that from this human now, the other shoe to drop. Uh, behavior in regards to dogs being beaten and abused and, and uh, severely uh, abused and dysfunctional on that aspect and they become reactive. And then for example, um, you know, a dog that is, is reactive in the sense that you can, you know, I've heard the trainers, like you say in these training groups, my gosh, it's so asinine. But you know, when you see a dog, um, that is you're petting this this dysfunctional dog and then suddenly the dog bites you and you're like well why that was out of the blue it's not it's just because our behavior and our inability to recognize our dog's uh, behavior is, is we're not paying attention at one tenth two tenths of a second though we have the capacity to do so we're not paying attention and what ends up happening is your dog is expecting the other shooter to drop because of the historical reference point of behavior and then they go, oh my gosh, this human's gonna do it to me too, so I better defend myself. And or the stimulant of uh, the stimulus of uh, of the affection is sometimes foreign to the dog in such a manner where then they start being reactive. As I said the other day, uh, you can be ticklish to a dog, and one of the you know feel the danger. I'll be ticklish. I'll be you know getting them in a point where they're ticklish, and then they don't know how to feel it. The feeling is different, and then they'll be reactive and they'll try to bite me, and then you know then it's like oh gosh. So um, always remember that. Uh, be consistent with your behavior with your dog. If you are going to be reactive or upset, make sure to reset yourself back down to that center point so your dog understands your tone is back to, to the same generality. Dogs 100% love being hugged. I've talked about this in one of my earlier uh, uh, vlogs, and that is a point of every single dog loves affection. Anybody who tells you no, dogs don't love affection, dogs don't like to be hugged, uh, that is a person that you want to find another trainer of behaviors to work with. Then they don't have the understanding of the visceral aspect of that. Absolutely, 100% every single dog loves affection. Why does that dog love affection? Because they'll come up to you. They'll nose you for affection. They'll lean up against you for affection and uh, a codependent or interdependent aspects of behavior. But they come up to you for that feeling of belonging that they'll put their paw on you their, their foot will step on you that is a codependency aspect but it's also an insecurity low self-esteem uh insecurity uh, uh self-confidence issues in regards to dog putting the paw on you or a dog pawing at you which is the codependency aspect right i'm just going through everything organically so everyone understands what i'm saying when it comes to the hugs the dog your dog comes up to you for affection when you're laying on the couch, your dog will lay beside you and some people's dogs will lay right on top of you if they could. When you look at the videos, uh, the hidden camera videos of wolves in the, in, the, in the caves and all that stuff, the wolves are laying right beside each other. Some are laying on top of each other. Puppies, 
they do it. They lay on top of each other. You see the pictures and the videos of puppies laying on top of other dogs, adult dogs with cats, with goats and everything. That's a hug. Oh, okay, there's William. Um, that's a hug. That's affection. Hi, William. William's, and William's a small Dane. He's a he's a like 105, 110 pound Dane. So he's a small Dane. So his head's huge, but he's a small Dane. But he loves affection. And even in this part here, I'm just touching him is all I'm doing. And he feels that comfort level. That goes on. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Right? You see his eyes? See the way he processes the affection? He feels it. As if you would be holding the hand of your boyfriend. Husband. Wife. Child. He feels it. Uh, so when it comes to the hug aspect of it, you want to, and I won't get into further the, too much detail about the hugs because it's more specific in regards to developing your dog's uh, uh, um, trust of being hugged. And I've, dealt, I've done this with predatorial dogs over months. It's taken me, but I've done it to the point where in the beginning, if I go to touch them or even near them, they will go attack me. They will stalk me within my own home. They will try to corner me to uh, be quite uh, uh, vicious to me to the point where after several months, I can give them a hug, a full hug. My face is right beside their face. And you know, dogs that have attacked children, dogs that have been quite vicious. You know, even with Nero, I told you uh, the other day, you guys, about him grabbing me by the top of the head just to warn me when I, when I was touching him after uh, the, the person I was living with, she had gone to work and all that stuff. You know, and then months later, well, actually not months, a few weeks later, I'm giving a full hug. My head is right beside his head, right beside Nero's head, affection, and he's pulling into his head towards me, right? Those of you who give hugs to your dogs, you notice that when you give your dog a hug, like a real full body hug, that they will start pushing their head against yours. That's affection. So anybody who tells you that dogs don't like hugs, find somebody else to train your dog. Uh, next one is physical intimacy, right? So again, that physical intimacy, which is the hug, right? Because then again, that is the exposure of your dog saying to themselves, I trust this human being, this cross species, this person who is not a dog. I'm trusting this person to give me affection. I'm trusting this person to embrace me in a hug so that they don't attack and kill me. Because to your dog, the threat is, and a dysfunctional dog, a, a predatorial dog, a dog that's been abused, their fear is being beaten. They're not afraid of death because they don't understand it. They are, and, I'll, and we'll get to that another time about why I know dogs don't understand death because of the process aspect of it, uh, the context of it. But anyhow, uh, they're afraid of getting hurt. A lot of times people who are abusive to their dogs will be abusive. They feel bad and they bring their dog back in for hugs and like, oh, I love you. So they basically create a, 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 a dichotomy, a, a duplicit aspect, uh, a discordant, discordant, uh, aspect of, of understanding they're human because one day you're happy the other day you're not like a bipolar person you know they're always the one day I mean we all we all know I mean I know people who are like that who are bipolar and it's horrific to be around them because one day they're super happy and then the other day they're super angry or within five minutes they go from happy to, to angry to sad and, and, and all that and you're like uh-huh what right for for the dog for our dogs they're processing their environment and their and our interaction with them based on their history. So with the dog, we don't know, we don't know their history, but if we know that they want to be touched and then they start being reactive, then you know, okay, then their history has to deal with the physical aspect, intimacy aspect, low self-esteem, and interdependency, a non-modular interdependency issue, just a whole bunch of things. The psychology is gorgeous about dogs and it works with the predators. And it's all about the intimacy. It's all about the trust. It's all about the codependency. A hug is that part. If I was to walk down the street um, and and some 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 guy just came up and gave me a hug, I'd be like, dude, right, right? Because I mean, like, who are you, right? You're, are you trying to steal my wallet? What are you trying to do? Like, who are you? Don't give me a hug. But if I was walking down the street and I and I saw a, a friend from school, you know, 20 years ago, whatever. He's gonna, and he's like, hey, man, where you been? I'm going to give it like, hey, dude, nice to see you, man. I haven't seen where you've been, right? Because I have an established level of trust with that person, right? For women, you're not going to let some strange man give you a hug. But if you know that man and you know him and you can trust him, you'll let him give you a hug. Trust is that aspect. Physical intimacy is trust. We don't have sex with somebody 
well, for those of you who do, it's not in my business, but for me, physical intimacy is a reflection of trust. And it's the most ultimate commitment that we can ever make between two human beings, whether, uh, regardless, sex is that intimacy, physical contact for a dog is such as intimate for them. It is a trust aspect there that your dog is trusting you to hold them where they can't get away. That's a, That's an intimacy that is earned through trust and through respect. So we want to do that. We want to gain our dog's trust, which is a nice segue to the next line, uh, right? We want to gain trust. We want to, we want to give our dog affection. We want to give our dog the ability to trust us, to give them affection, to hold us, and for us to hold them. Because when they lean up against us, when they come to us for affection, when we go and give them a hug, they're also committing themselves to us, and we are committing ourselves to them. With a dysfunctional, skittish, reactive, dangerous, predatory old dog, when we're doing this, as much as I feel extremely nervous and scared, I know that the dog that I'm hugging feels even more scared. And I know it sounds kind of funny and ironic, like, well, why would a dog that can have a 700 PSI bite strength and literally kill you be afraid of you? Because they're afraid of being hurt. They don't trust me. So it's the intimacy, that aspect of it is what happens. So we wanna make sure that we can gain our dog's trust through respect, through codependency, through uh, through reliable behavior, through consistency, right? So all these things that I, I talk about, right? You know, we want to do that. Our next one is understanding relational dependency of touch. So like I did with uh, William when he came up to me, the, the relational dependency of trust. We want to do that part where when we are touching our dog, wherever they are, the part of their body, et cetera, where, wherever we're touching our dog, they, they can rely on the stillness of our behavior. And this is why I tell people it's just anywhere from seven to 12 seconds, and sometimes four seconds, sometimes two seconds, sometimes 30 seconds. So it's just spend time with your hand on your dog without moving it. No fingers moving, none of that, you see that? No fingers are moving, nothing like that. Just keeping your fingers still, keeping your hands still, and just establishing that, which is the same thing as, going to see the sunset and holding hands with your lover. You're just holding hands. You don't even have to talk. You're not watching the sunset going, yeah, this is a really nice sunset. This is a beautiful sunset. Oh my gosh, honey, I love you. This is such a gorgeous sunset. Trust, stillness, gaining that trust, reliability, uh, presumption of regularity. That's another phrase. That's a legal terminology phrase, right? Uh, presumption of regularity. Uh, that's part of that jurisprudence aspect of it. But we, again, want to have our hand there. It doesn't matter where you are on the dog, right? And we determine uh, dog's joy spot, et cetera, et cetera. The next thing we want to do um, after the uh, understanding relational dependency of trust, because um, what it does is it allows us in this next line is how it resets our dog. The stillness. You know, if you got your kid, uh, for those of you who have children, you've got your kid running around and you can tell that he's kind of getting a little bit wild and crazy and he's going to start causing issues, what do you do? You go over to your kid and you're like, oh, I better calm him down before he gets too nuts or he starts crying. And so you go over and you grab your child and you're like, okay, sit down with me. Oh, mom just wants to show you something. Uh, Dad wants to share something with you. I want to tell you a secret, right? You, you're going to find excuses to do that, of course. But, oh, sorry, I'm not centered here. Uh, but you want to be able to... Um, just let your dog know um, that they just need to calm down, right? Watch the behavior of your dog as they start to get amped up, amped up in the in the in, in the in the dog park, and the other dog is humping your dog, and the, that that person's owner is uh, disrespectful and not doing anything about it. Your dog doesn't get upset about it, right? Because like, is this normal? Call your dog over if you have to step in, if you have to intercede, bring your dog over, reset with them, give them some time to calm down a bit, just touching them, holding them on the side of their body, on the top of their head, on there, on the side. There's certain parts on your dog's body that if you watch your dog while you touch them with the stillness, they're gonna pick it up and they'll be, they'll be like, okay, good. And that stillness has to be consistent, et cetera, et cetera. And it helps your dog to reset because then your dog is no longer feeling anxious. It's like you holding the hand of your child walking across a busy intersection. You can feel when they're about to move and then eventually your child trusts you and you feel a firmness of holding between you and your child and the hand is always firm. But in the beginning, you, you can always feel your child trying to pull away. Same thing with your dog, same thing like it is on the leash. Uh, all these aspects, watch my previous vlogs. Don't push progress either. Keep it simple, right? The KISS principle, don't push your dog's progress. If you've had some great inroads, 
give them a second day to have that same great in row. Right? I talked about yesterday about the plateau of your dog. Don't push your dog because you're trying to change their entire life. If your dog has been like in a, in a certain dysfunctional behavior and say you have a one-year-old dog, all they've known for their entire life up to that 12 months, that one year of age, has been dysfunction or reactivity, whatever it is. It's frightened them. It's scared your dog. It's caused your dog to become dysfunctional. That's why they've been surrendered or whatever. And then you get your dog and people who have worked with me, right, they'll, they'll do so and then they'll start going, this is great progress. And they're like, they're, they're, they're very happy and they're very impressed. And I, and I love that part of it. But then they start trying to push their dog too much. And it's not, it, it's a very common thing that happens because then we think, okay, our dog's fixed now, right? There's no such thing as fixed. If somebody has a, has a dysfunction, they have a trauma, uh, that person is going to take days, weeks, months, and usually years to get over it. Somebody who's been assaulted as a, a you know, like the, uh, you know, assaulted when they're young is going to take them years, if not decades, to come to terms with that. Your dog needs that too. It's resonant within their behavior, right? And the psychology is subconscious rooting of their behavior on that rudimentary aspect. And it's not a logical process other than logical, other than being a false or negative, false positive, et cetera, or default positive in that processing. It's the emotional context that your dog just like a human being is trying to process through. Don't push your dog. Let them have baby steps. Let it be glacial, right? Like a glacier, glacier takes millennia to, to move across inches. Give your dog that time to do so. Uh, people are just so quick to push their aspects of their dogs because we think this is great and we want them to help and we have such an endearment to them. But then let's put into context about the timeline. And, and it is a really difficult thing, right? Because um, we want so much for our dog to be this amazing dog and have this great life. So we, let's give them some time to, to relax and to, to calm down a bit and all that stuff. Let, let our dog have time to trust us, right? Like gaining that trust aspect. Um, so don't push progress. Uh, the dogs I have here, uh, I don't think about, I don't, I don't think about them, you know, going for runs and, and, and being cuddled with me in, in, you know, six months. Even when I got Tonka, um, I said, and originally I thought it was going to take him 12, nine to 14 months for, for progress. And then as I saw more things that come out, then found out he was partially blind, partially deaf and partial brain damage from being beaten so badly. I, I then said, you know, I revised this. It could take him anywhere from 12 to 17 months. And yeah, within four days, I had him off leash in dog park and able to connect with him verbally so he could trust me and, and all that stuff. But I knew intimacy-wise, the hugs, giving him a hug and all that stuff, it was going to take time. So 12 to 12, you know, it, it's this timeline that happens. I didn't look to see the, the end game. I just said, you know what, this window is what I'm allowing on the, on the open side. And I'm thinking, well, 19 months, two years, that's a very long time to wait. That's a very long time to progress. My, if I have my impatience, because we're, you know, in this world of technologically driven species that we are now, instant, everything's instant. You send a text to somebody, hey, how come they haven't responded? Context, give your dog that time. They are primal, they are predators. They are logic and emotional based dogs. Logic drive, emotional drive. That's what I call it, right? You know, I'm just gonna keep going on this aspect of it. So um, give them time. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go over uh, introducing dysfunctional dog again. Uh, I apologize. I feel like I'm that uh, Jimmy Kimmel guy that goes, you know, my apologies to Matt Damon. Um, but uh, I hope to do so. I, I don't have time to do the members' questions or anything like that. Oh, okay, you know, I'll do one members' question, and then I'll get going. I haven't eaten. I have not eaten a single thing all day today. I've been on on, on group calls and in sessions uh, all day, so I haven't I haven't eaten, and I got to eat because it's like. 939 here in, in uh, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, so the first question, which I'll answer, uh, Rita says, uh, people are saying the Staffordshire uh, is a dangerous uh, dog as well. And even their owners, oh, this is about another uh, thing, right? And the link is there. Um, is it dangerous as well? Even their owners, even owners of that breed will say things like, you need to be aware what kind of dog you have. It's a stereotype. It's a prejudice. It's something that we've created an envelope in our own comfortability to say, yeah, there's a problem. But 
But you know what? I deal with every single breed of dog, uh, mix, everything. Chihuahuas, Boston Terriers, little Frenchies. So angry, these little Frenchies. I dealt with a couple of them that were so angry that they were biting their own tongue out of anger and, 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 and dysfunction trying to get at other dogs or other people. I've had them where they've bitten me and they're so angry. They're so upset, so dysfunctional. They can't process through, right? Because they're the one tenth trigger time, not unpredictable. It's just how fast they're angry, right? So, so yeah, right? They're, they're hilarious, these Frenchies. They're adorable. They're like this big compared to the Great Dane, but man, they are just vicious. Uh, actually, I should say that because it was about the pit bulls and all that stuff. Somebody had asked the other day about it, right? About walking with a pit bull or someone in the neighborhood and all that stuff. You know, these smaller dogs. They're super fast so that even the big dogs, like the Danes and the Masters, they don't have an ability to compete. It's like, again, having, you know, Bruce Lee fighting uh, Andre the Giant. Bruce Lee's going to win. Well, he's dead, and so is Andre the Giant. But, you know, they were alive. <laughs> Bruce Lee's going to win because um, he's faster, he's smaller, he's quicker. Have you ever had a fight with anybody who's smaller than you and they're fast? They're going to kick your butt. These are the smaller breed dogs versus the larger breed dogs. It happens all the time. I wish I knew who's laughing because I think you guys are awesome because I love the feedback because then I'm not so alone. Bueller, Bueller. All right. So, um, uh, so she says, uh, even their owners are saying, right, you need to be aware of these dogs and all stuff. And so where the situation is, like I said before, pay attention to your dog. Be responsible for your dog. Every dog has the same psychological template, just like human beings. We have the same psychological template. Bring it all down to codependency. Certain breeds are going to have certain types of uh, uh, affectations for certain types of, uh, of relationships. They're going to have certain types of behaviors. Yes, of course, that is uh, uh, indigenous to their 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 spe their, their genus. They're not species, but their genus, their their uh, breed type. Just like you know, people say Asians are excellent drivers. Thank you, thank you, thank you for anyone who caught that. Asians are excellent drivers, um, but we're really bad at math. So, uh, you know, uh, it's that part, right? So, yeah, we want to recognize there are certain traits on it, but at the end of the day, it's a psychological process that's going on with our dogs. So the Staffordshire, the Pitbull, the Great Dane. People say Great Danes are really nice. Oh, I've never heard of a, of a dangerous Great Dane. I deal with it every single day. Even even uh, today, somebody was telling me about their Great Dane that they're dealing with, and their vet's telling them to kill their Great Dane. It's like wow. And I and I said to them, you know what? Just send your Great Dane over to a rescue. It's a different environment. Needs a different environment. You, your your home environment is causing the issue. Essentially, take responsibility. Send your Great Dane away to another rescue. But then people are like, well, that's my Great Dane, and he's going to be too dangerous and all that stuff. No, you're just being selfish ask a rescue explain the environment situation if it's a dog that is reactive and dangerous then of course they're 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 because of the limited type of limited type of trainers and behaviors that are out there then though those those dogs unfortunately get killed right the bite level six dogs bite level five dogs are being killed by ian dunbar's uh, rhetorical uh scale which is quite an immature perception make he stop Right, so we, there we go. He's growling. We just tell him to stop, and he walks away, uh, as he was uh, him and uh, William. It's that scale. Take responsibility of your dog. Uh, so the behavior that your dog, that particular dog, has, you can manage it. Right? They say that um, uh, like Chihuahuas and uh, Great Danes are very common breeds in Europe because of the low activity level. Absolutely, it's relative. You think a Chihuahua and you think a Great Dane, like two different. But it's just the type of behavior and it's the type of, uh, of relationship that we have with them as well. I've seen, like, you know, aside from my personal experience with vicious predatorial Great Danes, and I've dealt with them personally, the dogs that, again, trainers and behaviors, you know, uh, Dr. Ledger is like, kill. you got to kill this dog. There's no way to help. And I'm like, it's easy. It's really straightforward. Like even Stephen, you can say the same thing when I when I worked with you online with with Jackie today, with that uh, that little dog. They're all like that. Labradors. I've seen vicious Labradors. I've seen golden retrievers that are really vicious. And and some of you who have them know what I'm talking about. I would I would surmise forty percent of dog owners 
would say that their dog is reactive, dysfunctional, either skittish, reactive, etc. 40%. 6 million dogs are killed annually in North America. Almost 100 million dogs. So that means about 40 million dogs are like this. Look in the phone book. Google dog trainers and behaviorists. You're going to see, like even in this small town of Vancouver, there's probably 80 different dog trainers and behaviorists here. It's overkill. Um, okay, so uh, when it comes to the breed, we can have an understanding and the familiarity and understanding the breed specific aspects on a template, but again, it's how we treat them, how we take care of them. You know, the, the, the labs or are, are, uh, goldens are really common in regards to service dogs, but now they're transitioning to other breeds, right? Great Dane uh, for people who have mobility issues and all that stuff, and they're finding that they're having the same type of effectiveness as they would otherwise. Look at the, the German Shepherds that used to be used by the police. Now they're transitioning to other breeds. Used to be Dobermans before that. And now, you know, they're starting to come into some of the, the police uh, departments are starting to use pit bulls. It's just this ability to understand that the proper training, proper responsibility that we have for our dogs is what's imperative. And we've got to follow that through. If we're not following that through, then we create the problem ourselves which means we, the human beings, our dog's parent, need to take responsibility. So just keep that in mind. Be responsible. Pay attention to what your dog is doing. Your dog's humping other dogs, stop your dog. Don't be a jerk about it. Don't treat them badly. Just go stop. Just walk up to them like just casually, like, like as if you're telling your brother or sister to knock it off. Just walk up to them and say, stop it. Just stop. Right? Don't make a big deal. Just stop. If they keep it up, you just you interrupt them again. And the only reason that they keep it up is because they know it's getting attention from you, which then means a, a certain type of interdependency issue or interdependency issue that's going on as well. So you see what I mean? Like I can talk all the surface stuff, and it has certain relevance and has a certain generality, about 60 to 80% of it. But then we come into the dependency issues, the dysfunctions, the psychogenetic aspects, the psychosis of the dog's behavior, which is what I do. But generally speaking, these vlogs and all that stuff are in regards to the affectation of the dog's behavior in general speak. Pay attention to what your dog's doing. Correct them. Don't be a jerk about it. Just be very casual about it. Have conversational tone with your dog. Uh, speak to them in, with words that you use for a three or four-year-old child as well. And you're going to find this incredible change and shift in your dog when you start talking about them, when you start using their name, when you start talking to them as if they are people. Because they really are in that sense of emotional basis, right? The, the emotional context that your dog has with you is just incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, uh, profound and all that. Um, okay, so I'm going to be uh, closing off my, uh, my blog. Please share it. Please help me support this aspect, everything that you've heard. If you've heard it and it makes sense to you and you're finding it worthwhile, please share it. Please invite people to join my closed group so that the more the numbers happen, it's going to go on. Uh, I do have a, a couple links to my Patreon and GoFundMe page. A couple of people have donated in the past uh, some money and all stuff. It's great. I, I love that because it allows me to then go and donate that time back to people, do pro bono, and also looking for people who have uh, fixed incomes. And then I will pay it forward as well by matching that cost and value to other people as well. Anyone that knows me knows that I have dedicated a significant amount of my life uh, to helping dogs. And I provide a significant amount of pro bono even before I did the vlogs. Uh, I have spent uh, and invested over tens of thousands of dollars uh, in value uh, for pro bono. And I'm in almost three dozen groups, uh, three dozen rescue organizations that I help. And it's all done for free because, you know, it's, I just got to do it. Um, uh, again, if you can share my post, please, that would be awesome. Very much appreciated. If you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, that'd be great. Um, if I can keep the advertising off, which I have been off my website, there's no advertising. There's no pay site. There's absolutely nothing going on there. And I hope that I can keep it free forever. Uh, the vlogs are going to go on for free. Thank goodness that YouTube is free. Going to leave that on YouTube as well. I love you guys. Oh my gosh, you guys are gorgeous. Um, it just really just, it like makes me almost want to tear up a bit. Um, uh, just, just <clears throat> um, so yeah, the YouTube thing and all that stuff. It's all focus on it. Um, 
you know, all those things that are happening, I want to do this so I can leave the legacy behind. Everything that I've done is blowing away and disrupting the entire dog training industry. They, they, the, the people are suppressing. They're kicking me out of dog training groups all the time. And it's sad because they don't want to listen to stuff like this. But when we, I start talking to them like, hey, well, what about the codependency of this dog? And then I get kicked out. But then again, at the same time, they're going to the vet and getting medication, prescriptions to deal with their dog's behavior, which is psychological. Well, then the psychology is a codependency aspect rooted on all those dysfunctions. And then they're just shooting themselves in the foot. So the only way that my work gets around is by people uh, subscribing, absolutely doing that and by getting the word out and just sharing the stuff. I've had people who are watching this and you know, I'll get people go, I wanna hire you, then they'll watch my vlogs and they'll contact me a, a few days later, a week later and say, you know what, I, I watched your vlog and I'm gonna try that beforehand and if it doesn't work, then I'll, I'll, you know, but it's okay, we cancel. Absolutely, absolutely. If you gotta cancel, cancel, because my work helped you and you get to save $100, $200, $300, well, I charge a bit more than 200, but if you, get, if you can save that money and you don't have the stress in your life and you can do what you can with your dog, that means you're gonna go out and help somebody else. That means you're gonna say, hey, you know, I, I checked out James Chai's vlog and the few things in there and I watched and it worked out and I was able to work with my dog and I didn't have to spend $230 with him. And I was able to do it, but maybe you might want to watch his vlog. And if it doesn't help, then then there you go. And if that what helps them, then it helps them. It saves their dog's life. It saves your dog's life. It shouldn't be six million dogs being killed annually. Look at the abuse cases. Absolute abuse cases that are happening by people treating their dogs horribly. And then the rest of the neighbors and people closing our eyes, we're not watching stuff, the politicians doing nothing about it. My goal is to work towards the recognition of dogs as functional, sentient beings, to then be afforded limited legal rights. And then, then there'll be cats as well. Do you want to know there's actually more cats by about 2% on average than there are dogs in this world? Well, not in the world, but I mean domestically, I should say, in North America domestically. So there's almost 100 million dogs in, in North America. There's probably about 100 to 104 million cats in this world, uh, in North America, I mean. So, you know, cats are winning. Women are winning. Women, the women are winning. The men are in trouble. We're always dogs, right? You know, that's our uh, that part. Like I talked about the other day about calling people, uh, you know, the loved ones' names and all stuff, right? A little bit of a tangent here, as I always do. Um, but again, you know, feel free to share. Uh, please do so. Share it to your page. Uh, those of you who are in my closed group, please share my post uh please subscribe to my youtube channel for those of you i've helped for free uh, i do ask if you could do that uh just as in part of the commitment and agreement for me providing you free uh down training um help uh, I, I do so um and i do know that um uh, i'm i have a shared group session that i need to set up i have people already set up for it and so i'm going to uh, get some people together like auto I'll, I'll i'll get that together i have people there um with a couple other dogs um, and we'll, we'll do that session. It's just unfortunately my mind just gets so uh, uh, unfocused because you know, like this is going to take me six hours. It's, it's what uh, almost ten o'clock here. I will be finished probably about three or four a.m. tonight just to do this blog, a uh, vlog. Um, thank you so much. Have any suggestions? Any questions? Any comments? I can't answer them, but I will read them, and then I will try to address them the next day if I don't run out of time. Uh, interesting enough, somebody actually messaged me. Um, uh, on Facebook and said, uh, you know, didn't get a chance to see your, uh, didn't get a chance to see your vlogs. Uh, I have to catch up to them, have to binge on them. And they said, uh, it looks like you're doing one every single night and I don't know how you're going to keep that up. And I went, I'm going to try. I got to leave the legacy. So those of you who are watching this, uh, 50 years from now, this is for you. This is for your dog. And this is for the function uh, functional sentience of dogs, the recognition. This is for all these people in the future. This is for people to be able to see the difference in your dogs so they're no longer being killed. They're no longer suffering in that sense of being killed innocently. We are responsible for our dog's behavior. It's our fault. Our society realizes that. Our society can improve that, and we're going to do amazing things. Thank you so much. Have an amazing night. Do something kind to somebody. 
just by tolerating the conversation with them. For example, you're talking to somebody that you just don't want to listen to, count to, count to seven, count to 12 seconds before you say something. Don't have to take a deep audible breath, just take some time, just have some patience and then go, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, that's cool. Would it be okay if we talk about something else now? I don't want to hear about your ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend or whatever. Just a little bit. And then they get the idea. Connect to them. You guys are amazing. I'm getting ready to, uh, to end the live video. Uh, what I might do again is I might do a screen share in the future, I'll work on a video um, that I've done and then can explain it. Everyone take care. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you and have an amazing night.